Okay, hello everyone. I make it to be about quarter past uh, four, so I think it's probably time to start. Uh, it's a little bit weird doing this conference virtually, so I am sort of talking to a screen. Uh, so hopefully people are here and watching. Um, if you've got any questions for me during the chat, then please feel free to pop them in the uh, chat on the right, and I will take a look and answer them probably at the end. Uh, and if there are any technical issues, then give me a shout just so I know what's, uh, it's happening sooner rather than later. And I think only other bit of housekeeping is if you presumably you've seen enough of these sessions to know by now, but if you want to double click on uh, the, the screen share I've got rather than so you can actually see what I'm sharing, my slides and code, rather than just seeing my face. Uh, cool. So let's get into it then, shall we? So hi, my name's Charles. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about Blazor, which is going to be a new technology from Microsoft that lets us create client-side web applications that run in the browser written in C-sharp and using WebAssembly. So my slides and code are available on my GitHub. If you'd like to follow along or uh, refer to anything after the talk, then please feel free to find them on there. So a little bit about me. I'm a technical lead and software developer at a company called Geisten. We're a software development and consultancy firm based up in Bristol. So one of the things that's always interested me is, is it possible for us to build web applications without JavaScript? So historically, if we wanted to build any sort of complicated interactive web applications, we've always had to use JavaScript on the front end. And that's been okay, but it would be nice to have some alternatives. I'd really like JavaScript, but it would be great to sort of give ourselves a bit more flexibility. So this is where something called WebAssembly comes in. And WebAssembly is a technology that's going to let us take other languages and compile them down to run in the browser. And WebAssembly is supported natively by all modern browsers, and it's going to basically let us take modern to other languages other than JavaScript and run it on the browser. Now, Microsoft have been working on this framework called Blazor, which is a UI framework that works on top of this WebAssembly technology to let us actually build component-based UI frameworks, UI like component-based UI applications written in C Sharp and .NET. But then it uses WebAssembly to run on the browser. And I think Blazor is really cool because it's actually one of the first sort of big examples of a fully featured UI framework that's sitting on top of WebAssembly. And so what Blazor is going to give us is a is all our UI primitives around what we actually need to create an application. So it's going to give us our components, our rendering logic, our state management, etc., that we need to build on top of WebAssembly. So Blazor's been out for only a few months now. I think it 1.0'd in about May of this year. And I think it's really cool and interesting new technology. And we've been using it at Geisten. We've been trialing on some production projects. And it is production ready now. And I want to share my thoughts on what it is actually to like, what is it, what it's like to write Blazor applications, talk through a little bit about how it works under the hood, and share our thoughts around what are the considerations you need to think about when you're building Blazor applications. So I think the first thing we really want to look at is let's take a look at how Blazor is actually what Blazor is actually like to write code in. I think the easiest way to do that is to take a look at a demo. So I've got a very simple Hello World application here. So what we have here is a single Blazor component called Hello World.Razor, which is just rendering a you know, Hello Tech Exeter bit of information. And if you look at the left here, you'll actually see what a Blazor component looks like. Essentially, it's a .Razor file. And we've got two main areas. We've got at the bottom this at code block. And this lets us define any sort of C-sharp code in here. So we can write in uh, private states, private met fields, et cetera. We can put in methods. We can put in our logic. So we can do anything we can do in normal C-sharp code we can put in here. And then the second main area you'll see is this HTML, something that looks a little bit like HTML. If you've written any C-sharp before, you might recognize this as being C-sharp's Razor templating engine, which is what lets us produce HTML code from C-sharp. And so essentially, we end up writing something that looks a little bit like HTML, but we can use this at symbol to escape out into C-sharp. And from that, we can access any private state, any sort of methods on our at code in our code block. And so we can put in you know, our logic and our interactivity. And so this is C-sharp code, and it's running in the browser. And I'll show you how that works in a little bit. But let's take a look at a bit more complicated example. I think Hello World is a bit basic. So during lockdown, I've been eating a lot of takeaway. So I thought, let's build a takeaway ordering application. So we're going to build Blazor Bytes, which is going to let users come in and choose some food they want to order. So they're going to see a menu and a list of dishes they want to choose from. They're going to choose which dishes they want to order. They're going to put then they're going to put in their name and address so we know where to send those, where to send their food to. And then once they place that order, we'll go and send that food to them. So not too complicated, but let's go away and actually build that. So 
I've set up a very basic, simple page now that's not doing a lot. It's just showing a loading screen at the moment. And this is currently tracking a bit of state around our, old, our order. And we're also tracking a status to see where we are in the order workflow. So let's go ahead and actually implement this now. So what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we want to do is go and actually grab that list, the menu, the list of dishes from our server. So I've actually already written an API server, which is getting that data. And I've created a C Sharp class called a dish, which is going to represent the response from that data. So we've got a name and a price. Now, interestingly, I've actually defined this dish for, to use in my server project, in my server code. But I put it in this shared folder, which means I can actually access it from my client. Because my client code is just C Sharp, I can reuse my code across the, the back end and the front end. So if we go back into our order flow, we want to actually grab that list of dishes. So how are we going to do that? We want to load that data from the API server when our component first renders. And so Blazor, be, Blazor sort of features the standard sort of component lifecycle hooks that you might be used to from other component-based UI frameworks. So if we want to fetch data from the API on load, we can do that by actually overriding the oninitialized async method. So we're going to override the oninitialized async method on our component. And this is going to be called when the component first renders. Then we can store some state to actually keep track of the dishes we've loaded. So we're going to load out a list of available dishes. So let's create a collection of available dishes as some private state in our component. Now we want to actually fetch this from an API. Well, the way that we grab data from an API in C Sharp is we use an HTTP client. So this is a built-in class that allows us to go and fetch data. If you've done any C Sharp programming before, you'll know that you don't commonly create a C an HTTP client manually. You'd actually inject that into your application using something called dependency injection. So we'd register the way that we construct our HTTP client centrally at application startup. And then any components that depend on it can ask for an instance of an HTTP client and get it with all sort of the pre-configured details around authentication, et cetera. Well, Blazor features in dependency injection out of the hood. So we can actually inject in an HTTP client by using this at inject HTTP client syntax. And then we have access to an HTTP client in our code. And so we can actually just assign our available dishes to our collection to the result of an AP HTTP call. So we can say available dishes is HTTP client.get from JSON and then ask for API slash menu. And once we've got it out, we can just we'll just store update our order status to be choose dishes because we now loaded out those dishes and we know we want to get them. And let's just check that we've actually got that data back. So let's say that we've received available dishes dot count dishes. And you notice that with this at symbol, I can escape out into sort of any arbitrary C sharp here. So I can use my out count method. And if we load, reload the page, we'll see that we've received three dishes. Brilliant. So what do we want to do now? Well, now we actually want to show those dishes to the user and let the user choose from the menu. So how are we going to do that? Well, we could start building that up inside this component, the, our order flow component. But it's going to be best practice to split out our code into sets of smaller reusable components. So it probably makes sense to actually create a separate menu component. So if we go back into our files, we can create a new component by creating a new file. And let's call it menu.razor. So component files are .razor files. Now, in this component, we know we want to take some input from the order flow. We actually want to take the input of the menu. So to take input, we can create a parameter, which is going to represent any input from a parent component. And we can create a property to hold that parameter. So let's ask for a collection of dishes called dishes. Now, we actually need to render these dishes now. So let's start by creating a dish, a, a div. And we want to render each dish. So we can break out into rendering something for each dish. We can break out into an app for each loop, standard C sharp for each loop. We can say for each dish in dishes. We then want to render something for the dish. Now, I've actually already built a dish selector component, which is going to take as a parameter a dish. And the last thing to do is to go back into our order flow and actually render our menu component. So instead of rendering this placeholder div, let's render our menu component and let's give it a dish. Dishes is available dishes. So to render a component, we just render an element with the name that matches the component. And we can pass parameters by passing attributes to that. Now, if we let our, our code recompile and we refresh the page, we can now see that we've actually got a menu and we can choose from some burgers, some pizza, or some tacos. So next step is to actually let the user choose from these dishes. Because at the moment, if I click these plus buttons, they don't actually do anything. So we need to wire up some state to handle that selection, what happens when the user press, clicks on those buttons. So if we go back to our menu component, 
we actually want to wire up some state to track which component, which dishes have been selected. So the way that we handle state in Blazor is we just create a mutable field on our code, in our at code block. So we can just create a private collection of selected dishes. And so when we up, to update the state, we'll just update this field and Blazor will know when we respond to an event to see the new state and work out how the HTML and the DOM should be updated. And we'll just create a method that will handle what happens when one of these buttons is pressed. So we'll create a method that when, a, but when one of these buttons is pressed, if the dish is already selected, we'll remove it from our collection. And if the dish isn't selected, we'll add it to our collection. And the last thing we need to do is actually wire up this logic. So my dish selector does actually have these parameters already set. So we can say that a dish is selected if selected dishes contains our relevant dish. And we can say that when a dish is selected, we're just going to invoke our on toggle dish selected method. And so you'll notice that as passing as parameters, we can just pass in the, net, the references to functions in our code, or we can even pass in sort of more complicated C-sharp so we can invoke expressions, so checking whether a dish is contained. And if we refresh the page now, we should see that we can actually choose the dishes and they're updating. So next step is to actually allow the user to confirm the dishes. So we now need to communicate up to the parent component once the user has chosen their dishes and placed their order. So how are we going to do that communication? Well, we've shown how to do parent to child component communication via parameters, but we can't use that to go back up the tree. So sort of data flow naturally is unidirectional down our component tree. So to emit data back up the tree, we actually need to do something a little bit a little bit more explicit. We need to emit some callbacks that the parent component can listen to and handle. So to communicate information up the tree, we're going to create a parameter. I'm going to create a parameter of type event callback. And we're going to give that event callback a type of collection of dishes, because we're going to pass up the selected dishes. And we can call this on dishes selected. So this function will be called when a when the user is confirmed to their dishes, their dishes they want. And we can wire this up with a button. We'll say place order. And to actually make sure that but that function is called on click, we can say at on click. And I'm going to give this a lambda function because I just wanted to find this in line. I'm going to say when this button is clicked, we're going to take on dishes selected and we're going to invoke that with the selected dishes. So a few things going on here. You'll notice we're using an at on click rather than just writing on click. This is a directive in Blazor, which means we're modifying the output HTML. And so we're not actually binding directly to the on click JavaScript event in the button. We're binding to this sort of event that's going to be handled in our C sharp code. So we need Blazor to wire that up correctly. So we put this at and we're putting a Lambda function in here. I could have pulled this function out into my code block, but I'd rather I don't want to define this and reuse this. So I'm just going to put a single inline anonymous function, which I'll do as a Lambda function, hence the fat arrow. So next step to do is just to go back into our order flow and actually do something when that button is clicked. So let's write a function that's going to get called when those dishes have been selected. And what we'll do is we will take our dishes as an argument and we will assign those dishes to the order that we're using to track our overall order state. And we will just update our state to be order details. And we just now need to actually wire up that event callback to be called. So again, since this is a parameter, we're just going to pass an attribute on dishes selected and we're going to tell it to call our on dishes selected method. And if we let this compile, we now see that when I refresh the page, I can choose some dishes and I can place my order. And we get to the to do enter order details. So what do we need to do now? We need to let the user put in their own, put in their name and address. So how are we going to do that? Again, this is something we want to put in its own component. So let's create a order details dot razor component. And we know that as input to this component, we're actually going to want to take in that order that the parent component is tracking. OK, so what do we actually want to render here? Well, we want to render a form that's going to let the user choose their name and address. And these name and addresses are actually tracked on the order model itself. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can start rendering a form, and we can start rendering a label, and we can say your name, and we can render an input that we're going to try and wire up to your name. But how are we actually going to wire up that input to the name? Well, we want to have a two-way data binding here. So we want to ensure that when someone types into the input, the event is fired and it actually updates the value of our C sharp source, our C sharp model, so our order. But we also want to make sure that if someone updates, if some of our code updates the model, that we update the input with the correct value. So we want to have two-way data binding between our C sharp code and our HTML.
So we could wire this event handling up ourselves. We could buy into the change event and listen to that, and we can make sure our value is set properly. But this is sort of very standard boilerplate that you'd be expected to find in you know, most applications. So actually, Blazor has a lot of helpers for these out the, hood, out the box. So to render a form, we're actually going to start by rendering an edit form component. And this is something that's built into Blazor, and we're going to pass that a model parameter, and we're going to say our model is our order. So this is just going to track the overall state of our form. And it's going to give us things like tracking submission states and whether which fields have been modified, validation, sort of you know, global form concerns. And let's render a label. Let's say your name. And to render the input, we'll actually use the built-in input text component. Again, this is going to wire up our data bind, our two-way data binding. And what we need to give to this input text is this slightly interesting at bind value expression, which we're going to then bind to our order dot customer name. And we can do the same with address. And so what this at bind value is actually doing is wiring up this two-way data binding between our model and our input, so into our DOM. So we're going to make sure that our the data updates flow both ways. And if we go back to our order flow, let's just actually make sure this is rendered by rendering an order details. And we'll say that we have an order is our order. That seems to, yeah, that's fine. So we refresh the page and we choose dish and place our order. We now get a form for name and address. Brilliant. So what do we need to do now? Well, we need to actually let the user submit that data. So let's create a button. We'll give that type is submit. So we'll just submit the form. And we'll say place order. Now we need to actually do something when that button is clicked. So we need to wire up to the submit event. So let's start writing a function that's going to get called when a when the func when the order is submitted. So let's have a task and let's say on submit. And what do we want to do when it's on submitted? We want to actually want to send our order to the server because we know it's ready so we can replace it. So again, to send something to the server, we just need to inject in an HTTP client so that we have that access to an HTTP call. And then we will send that to the server by calling HTTP client dot post as JSON async just to send it as the server. So we'll send it to the order endpoint and we'll post our entire order. Now, what do we want to do when we've got that order? Once we've sent that order, we want to go back and communicate up to the parent component that order's been confirmed so that it can display you know, a success message. So again, to communicate up to a parent component, we're going to create an event callback parameter, and we're just going to invoke that parameter. Now, we're actually just going to pass in null in this case because we don't need to, we don't particularly care about passing up a specific bit of data, and you know, so we haven't actually given event callback a type. And the last thing to do is to wire up that submit to that method, submit method to be called. So we say on the form, we're going to wire up to the on valid submit event, and we're going to call on submit in this case. And again, in our order flow, we're just going to make sure that we actually listen to that event. So let's create a method to track what happens when an order has been confirmed. So we'll just say that our status is now order confirmed. And we'll say here that on order confirmed is on order confirmed. And we let this compile. We come in and we will choose an order. I can put my name, my address, and I can place my order, and my order's on its way. Brilliant. So what is left to do? Well, there's one thing left, which we haven't really thought about, is what happens if I come in and place an order, but don't put in a name and address? So we want some validation to stop people getting that far. So how can we go about doing that? This is going to happen back in the order details component. And if we take a look at our order class, we'll actually find that order class already has these C sharp data annotations on them. So these requ these have required attributes on them, which are going to say normally tell C sharp code to say, expect that this value is required. And if I was building a production application, I would have made my API server actually check those data those annotations and make sure that my data I'm sending to the API server actually is valid. But I'm not doing that. So how do we? How are we going to handle that on the client? Well, wouldn't it be great if we could reuse the code that we've written to a backend validation and reuse that across the front end? And of course, yes, we can because we're doing Blazor, so we've got C# -sharp code on the front end. So if we go back to our order, de our order details, we can wire up validation by just rendering this built-in data annotations validator component, and this is going to wire up that validation. And then the last thing to do is to actually make sure we've got some something to display the validation errors. So let's create a validation message component which is just going to point to the customer name and the customer address. And I'm going to let that compile. And if we put our order in, we'll now see that if I try and place the order without placing a name and address, 
we're going to get a validation error. And yet, if I actually start typing in, the validation will handle it and update. So we've got validation, and that's working out the box. So that is a very simple demo, sort of what Blazor gives us. And obviously, Blazor has a lot more out of the box. So we have support for routing, for layout, for authentication, authorization, all these sort of standard features that you might need to handle in a web application. But I want to talk a little bit about how Blazor actually works under the hood. Because I've shown you writing C-sharp code, and I've shown you running it in the browser. But I guess you're asking, how do we actually get from writing C-sharp code to getting that running in the browser? So this is where WebAssembly comes in. So WebAssembly is a low-level assembly-like language that can run within that runs within the browser within the same execution engine as JavaScript. And historically, it's had a real focus on performance. So it's stored in a compact binary format, and it doesn't need to be passed and interpreted by the browser in the same way as JavaScript. So it could be used to build applications that just are too perform have too high performance requirements to run in JavaScript. So you might want to build some complex games or et cetera, or something like that. But WebAssembly is also great as something we can compile down to. Because what we can view WebAssembly as is a sort of intermediate or assembly-like code that we can take our other languages to, our other languages, and compile it to, to become WebAssembly. And that's one of the intentions of WebAssembly. It's intended to be this sort of low-level compilation target. Now, it's great that we can compile down to these things. We obviously can't take our normal code and just compile it straight down to run the browser because we don't know what platform it's going to run on. So we can't just take any sort of old C code and compile it down because we don't know whether that's eventually going to be running on a Windows machine or a phone or a Mac, et cetera. So that's why WebAssembly sort of acts as this intermediate language that we can target and compile down to. And then it's going to be actually converted to machine code at runtime by the browser. So it's similar to actually how C-sharp works under the hood with its uh, intermediate language and similar how Java works with the bytecode. So WebAssembly actually looks a little bit like this. So it's stored in this binary format, like I said on the right. So this is actually what, when you compile WebAssembly down to, you just get a load of binary data. But it does actually have a textual format. So similar to sort of a physical assembly language, there is a text representation. So WebAssembly, a simple add function would look like this. And it's quite low level. It's actually a stack-based language. So each operation is going to either read something off the stack or put something onto the stack. So again, similar to how Java bytecode or c -sharp's IL works. But we don't really want to be writing code directly like this. I mean, this is really low level. You don't, you know, to add two functions, you need to sort of be calling all these various things. Add two values, you need to be calling all these various functions. It's not particularly nice to write. So what it's better suited as is we take our other languages and compile it down to WebAssembly. So how do we actually do that with C Sharp? How did we get that C Sharp code that I was writing running on the browser on top of WebAssembly? Well, the obvious choice would be to take our C Sharp code, probably compile it down to intermediate language, to our bytecode, and then compile that to WebAssembly and then run that on the browser. And that will work great, but it's actually quite hard to do. And there's various technical limitations of that. And we need to think about how long it takes to do builds, because that's going to slow down the development process. We need to make sure our final bundle size isn't too big, because if it is, it's not really going to fly on the browser. So actually, what's happening in the .NET space is something slightly different, and something that solves a lot of our technical issues up front. What we actually have instead is that the .NET runtime itself has been compiled to WebAssembly. This is actually using the mono.NET runtime. So this is the cross-platform version of .NET. And that's been compiled to, to WebAssembly. And that's what Blazor ships with. And so what Blazor then does is it takes your c -sharp code, which has been compiled as normally, normal to normal c -sharp binaries, to normal c -sharp intermediate language. And it just directly executes your compiled c -sharp code in the browser. So instead of having to compile our C-sharp code down to WebAssembly, we've just compiled the runtime to WebAssembly and are using that to support our C-sharp code at runtime. So you know, essentially, we've sort of skipped a step. We don't have to compile our code. It makes things a little bit easier. And I can prove this to you. If we go back to our demo and we bring up the dev tools, if I go into my application and I clear my cache and we clear the network log, and refresh the page, we'll actually see that we are getting a load of DLL files. So in here, we have our blazerbytes.dll, as you might expect. So we're getting our blazerbytes client DLL and our blazerbytes shared DLL. But we're actually also getting a load of system files. And we're even getting MS Core lib, which is the .NET standard, run, standard library. So we're actually loading. So normal c -sharp binary files. These are the normal things that you'd fetch if you do a new get install on a package or start up a new .NET project. You get these normal c -sharp binaries, and we're shipping them to the browser and running them in the browser. So the .NET runtime that's then running in WebAssembly is responsible for executing those. And it's actually being a little bit clever. It's actually a stripped down version of the full .NET runtime, and it's actually just interpreting that code. So it doesn't have the full set of performance 
optimization. So we dispatch in the fully, fully featured .NET runtime. So we don't have just-in-time compilation, et cetera, which means it is running a little bit more slowly. But it does mean it runs within the browser. And we can check that I can show you that we've got a .NET.WASM file in here. And this is responsible for actually executing the, the this is the actual .NET runtime that's been compiled to WebAssembly in advance. The one other thing we do have in here is there's actually a blazor.webassembly.js file. So why have we got JavaScript that we're running on top of WebAssembly? Isn't WebAssembly meant to be an alternative to JavaScript? Well, yes, but WebAssembly actually can't interop with the browser APIs directly. You can't make calls to the browser APIs, and you can't update the DOM directly from WebAssembly. So to do that, we actually need to call out to JavaScript. And the, it's actually fairly easy for WebAssembly and JavaScript to talk to each other. They can point to shared memory and sort of share pointers and share data between them. And they run in the same execution context within the browser, within the same sandbox, within the same security environment. So they are, are actually running alongside each other and can talk to each other. So we need to have some JavaScript that the WebAssembly code can talk to to actually update the, to actually do the DOM updates. And that's what this blazor.webassembly.js file handles. Well, this also does is it actually bootstraps the WebAssembly file because there's no way of just sort of telling the browser to execute a WebAssembly file directly. We need to write some JavaScript which will fetch that down and load it. So what we end up with is this sort of three tiers of technologies. So at the bottom, we have WebAssembly, which is underpinning everything. This is then being used to run our .NET runtime, .NET.WASM, which has been compiled down to WebAssembly. And that .NET runtime is responsible for running our application code as well as the Blazor code. And so Blazor is sort of sitting on top of this as a UI runtime. And so this is giving us our actual the actual tools we need to build applications. So it's giving us our component model. It's giving us our layout model, our routing model, all these things we need to actually build the components. Because it's all well and good just having code compiling down to WebAssembly. But if we don't have anything to actually build applications on top of that, we're going to end up doing a lot of reinventing the wheel. And you know, it's not really particularly productive. So I've said that .NET Runtime is executing C-sharp files. But I was, when I was writing components, I wasn't showing you C-sharp directly. I was showing you .razor files. So how does the .NET Runtime actually handle that? Have we updated the .NET Runtime to be able to support running those? Well, no. What's actually happening is that those .razor files are being compiled. When we do the compilation, those are actually getting turned into standard C-sharp files. So they look a little bit like this. They get turned into normal C-sharp classes, where all that at code block just gets turned directly mapped directly into the class. And all the HTML gets mapped into this fairly horrid looking generated build render tree method. And what Blazor is actually doing here is it's building up, on each render, it builds up this in-memory render tree, which is an in-memory representation of the state of the DOM. And when Blazor, re when a component re-renders, so when it has a state update, Blazor will work out the new render tree and the old render tree and work out the difference between them. And then it'll actually, from that, work out the minimal updates needed to update the DOM. So it's basically a virtual DOM, very similar to your client, how your client-side JavaScript SPA frameworks works, like React. Um, essentially the same idea. So I've talked about WebAssembly and how Blazor runs on top of WebAssembly. This isn't actually the only way that Blazor can run. If you think back to that diagram with the three things sitting on top of each other, we could swap out the under underlying rendering engine. There's no need for that to run sort of in this WebAssembly running on the browser directly. And so there is actually another format of Blazor, which is production supported. And that's something called Blazor Server. And in Blazor Server, the WebAssembly code actually, sorry, the Blazor UI code actually executes in on your server. And so all your C sharp code executes on the server. And to talk between the client and server, it actually uses a WebSockets connection. And if you perform any up, any action on the client, so if you click a button, it'll actually fire an event, fire the event details over that WebSockets connection. And then the c -sharp code will run on the server. It'll work out the diff to the HTML and send that back across the wire. And then some JavaScript on the Blazor server provides will actually do that update on the client. And that has some benefits, because it means we don't have to get our c -sharp code running on the client. We don't have to worry about WebAssembly. We are always executing in the context of the server, so we can do things like access the database directly as a response to a button click. But it does mean that we have this latency between the client and server. And yeah, if you've got 200 milliseconds latency between the client and server and you click a button, it's going to take 200 milliseconds before you even see any response come back from the server. And so it can make your application feel quite sluggish and has scalability concerns if you can't guarantee a low latency environment. But what about else? Can we cast our, can we cast our minds any further? What about, could we get Blazor running on the desktop or can we get it on running on mobile devices? Well, yes. I mean, the native, the, the naive immediate option is to use something like Electron or a WebView to take our 
blazor code that's running in the context of a browser and ship that in sort of a minimal browser wrapper that looks like an application. So, you know, similar to how sort of Visual Studio Code and Slack work, wrap it in Electron and we could get it running on the browser. Or we could use a progressive web application. But we could actually go further and we could rip out the rendering engine completely because the Blazor UI runtime, UI framework, doesn't necessarily depend directly on the, on the rendering engine. And so we could render to native mobile components. And that's actually something the Microsoft team have been looking into. And so they've showed demos of using Blazor to actually output Dart, uh, Flutter components or actually output Xamarin components. And so using Blazor to sort of build native mobile applications. This is something that's really experimental and this isn't production ready, but this is something that the Microsoft team are looking into and might be coming out in the next few years. It's quite interested. interesting. So that's sort of how the technology works for Blazor and that's all well and good. But an interesting question to me is what's Blazor actually like to work with? What's it like to build applications with it? Because it can be the best technology, the best tech stack under the hood, but if it's not actually nice to work with and good for building applications, then it's not going to be particularly suitable. And so I want to say, actually, yeah, Blazor has actually been really enjoyable to use on, on production projects. I'd say overall, it's been, it actually really makes it quite easy to write C-sharp code that runs on the browser. It's probably the best implementation of a non-JavaScript language-based web framework that I've seen. It gets a lot of things right, and it's generally really seamless and actually really easy to pick up. And we found really good choice for new developers, really good choice for sort of quickly getting something up and running. So there's fairly, there's quite a few good points I want to go through. Um, primarily, I think the first thing you're going to notice is the, the code sharing between the ability to share code between the back end and front end, if you've got a .NET back end, is actually incredibly good. It's hard to overstate how helpful this is. You can share your type definitions between the back end and front end. So you know your API responses and requests are really nice to share instead of having to duplicate that. But you can also share your business logic code and your validation code across the back end and front end, and which is actually really good because it means that you save time in having to re-implement them across two different languages, and you ensure that there's no discrepancy between the two implementations. So you're guaranteed, you know, you, you lose down a class of bugs and you make things a little bit faster to develop. I think this is a really big win. And you know, if you've got a .NET backend and you're thinking about how to pick a front end technology, Blazor is a great fit in because of that. Obviously, if you don't have a .NET backend, then Blazor becomes a lot less of a strong choice to choose because you still got that two, you still got that separation between the backend and front end at that point. You're pulling in the full power of .NET and C Sharp. I think this is a really big thing as well. You know, the .NET standard library is huge and really powerful. And the set, the open source ecosystem around .NET is really big. And we've got ASP.NET Core, which gives us a lot of web abstractions that are very useful to have. And using Blazor on the front end, using C Sharp on the front end actually gives us a lot of this and it's really useful. Um, so, you know, you compare the .NET standard library to the JavaScript standard library and it's just, there's a lot of difference. Even if you're pulling in helper libraries like Lodash, .NET is giving you a lot out of the box and it's very easy to work with. And we can pull in power of, power of ASP.NET, so the server side um, web framework for .NET. So this is giving us the standard sort of primitives around logging and dependency injection and validation that we can reuse across our front end. And actually we can reuse a lot of existing open source libraries. And the other thing that's gonna make Blazor really nice to use it is actually the, the framework, the UI framework is really fully featured out of the box. So I showed you that it's got forms and validation support, but we've also got routing, authentication, authorization, layouts, all the sort of standard things that you need to do to build applications, to build you know, real production applications. And it, because it comes with all this out of the box, it's actually really quick to get up and running. What that does mean, however, is that it's actually quite opinionated. And so you are sort of generally guided into doing things the way that Blazor is intended to be used. And so if you want to go a little bit off-piste and do things a little bit out of the box, it can be a little bit harder to do. Uh, Blazor does, it is very pluggable. So we can plug out sort of components and you know put in our own custom logic. So I think validation is a good example for that. If you want to use your own custom validation library, it's quite easy to actually hook that validation into Blazor, so Fluent Validation is a really common .NET validation library that we can plug in very easily into the front end. And for example, we've done a lot of customization of our forms logic. We're able to pull out the forms bit and implement it how we want to and change it a little bit. But you know that does have its downsides, and generally it's easier if you sit with it, stick within sort of the Blazor standard way of doing things. Which means I'd say it's definitely easier to get up and running with Blazor. But if you compare it to something like React, where you've got more choices it's harder to get you know it's harder to get react up and running but you're going to have more options and generally a bit more flexibility in the long run now the one thing i didn't show you is that blazor does actually have debugging support so 
you might think, how do we actually debug our, our code? It's a little bit, it's not the most obvious how that's actually going to work because we can't really use the Chrome debugger, even though it's running in the browser, because the Chrome debugger doesn't understand, doesn't understand our .NET code. And the Microsoft team have actually explicitly supported this. And so using the Chrome re uh, remote debugger protocol, you can actually connect Visual Studio or Visual Studio code to the debugger and then debug within your IDE, uh, which is quite useful. It's not as powerful as debugging through your IDE normally because it's going having to go through sort of this abstraction layer, but it definitely gets you most of the way there. You know, you can place breakpoints, you can see the state of variables. So it's definitely 80% of what you need to sort of figure out exactly why things aren't working how you expect, which I think is pretty key. However, you will find you hit some downsides when you're working with Blazor. So the first thing you're going to notice is the development experience is a little bit rough. So I think you'll notice that there's no hot reload. And actually, you might have seen in my talk that every time I made a change, I had to wait a little bit for the compiler to kick in and then refresh the page. If you compare this to sort of when you're working with equivalent JavaScript web app frameworks, you know, this is a lot slower and this is, the tooling isn't as good as we're used to in that space. And even on a sort of a, a medium-sized project, we've definitely noticed it's getting to the point where it can be sort of 20 seconds to do a full compile. And that's a bit painful when you're trying to do sort of small iterative tweaks to a UI. If you want to sort of change how things look and tweak appearance, and you want to make a change, see how it looks, make a change, see how it looks, you end up having to sort of wait a little bit. And it slows down your overall development in a loop compared to JavaScript frameworks. And it's just generally just something that's going to slow you down overall. Likewise, the debugging is a little bit harder compared to your traditional debugging or even just direct JavaScript debugging. You know, we're going through this sort of abstraction layer, so we don't have as much power. And the IDE support can be a little bit lacking. Uh, when I've been practicing this talk about half the time, the Visual Studio would get very confused by the code I was writing that was completely valid and the compiler would support, but Visual Studio code would start showing me sort of, you know, red squiggly lines everywhere. And likewise, I use JetBrains Rider a lot, and that shows a lot of red squiggly lines under certain scenarios. So you have to get used to your IDE not being completely supporting sort of every blazer bit of, every bit of blazer functionality. But there's two more major issues, which are around performance and download size. So, because these are a lot harder to work around. So the performance is a big hit. So I've said that the .NET runtime running on WebAssembly is only interpreting our code. So that means it doesn't have the full power performance optimizations that normal .NET runtime has, like just-in-time compilation. And that means our code runs significantly slower than on the normal .NET framework. Now, that's normally OK, because we tend not to be doing too much work on the client side. But it is actually worth being aware that the Blazor as a UI framework is going to feel it's going to be less performant than your JavaScript UI framework. So it's slower than React, Angular, and Vue. And there are going to be pages where you're building more, you know, places where you're building more complicated pages with more UI components on pages, or if you have many form elements or a lot of interactivity, when it does start feeling sluggish earlier on than you would be used to with your other sort of spa frameworks. So there have definitely been places where we built complicated forms where I know if I threw that something like React, it would just handle that and I wouldn't have to think about performance optimization at all. With Blazor, I do actually have to start thinking about that earlier. And you know, a lot of the time you can get by without this or you can solve it, but that lower threshold for needing to do performance work is going to make you have to do more work overall for Blazor. And so we see a lot of these cases where input handlers take sort of 200 milliseconds. And so, for example, that's meant that we've had to only fire, input, uh, only fire our events when someone tabs out of the form input, for example. We can't update as, every, as someone types, which gives us a slightly less nice user experience than we might be used to. The big win for performance would be ahead of time compilation. So if we think back to how I said C -sharp comp the C -sharp to WebAssembly compilation works, it'd be great if we could compile our C -sharp code directly to WebAssembly, because then we'd lose this interpreter and things could be a lot faster. Uh, that is being worked on by the .NET team, but it is definitely not anything happening immediately. There's a lot of technical problems, and so I'd expect this to not come in anytime soon. There are performance improvements coming up in the next release of Blazor, which is coming out this autumn, and hopefully that will make some improvements. But you know, there are still going to be some issues. The other thing you'll hear a lot about Blazor is the download size. So in that simple demo I showed you, we were actually downloading five megabytes of data when we loaded the page. That's down to needing to load the .NET runtime and needing to load all those .NET libraries, which is pretty big, and they're not optimized for size. Now, this is Blazor is actually doing some work to reduce that size. So when you run in production mode, it is actually stripping out that size a little bit. And with that five megabytes I'm showing, that's not actually sitting behind a compression server at the moment. So if we G zipped that or broadly compre compressed it, we could get that down. I think we could get it down to sort of a two megabytes on a minimal Blazor install. Uh, but that's still quite big for a lot of web applications. That can definitely be a bit of a deal breaker if you're really worried about time to first load. Uh, 
And so it's definitely worth being aware of because in some applications, that's going to be enough to you know, say we can't use Blazor. This is obviously on the, only on the first load and subsequent loads it's cached. And so you know, if you're, someone's using your site a lot, they won't notice it. But if you've got a lot of people coming to your site for new, if you've got some public facing web application, it's going to be a deal breaker. And I would last, last thing I would just want to say is that you're not going to be able to escape writing JavaScript and CSS completely. This isn't a silver bullet to escape the fact you're in the front end. Uh, we found that when we want to do anything a bit more complicated, we've generally found that we need to go out to sort of existing JavaScript libraries. And we've ended up writing a bit of JavaScript to interop between Blazor and JavaScript and those JavaScript libraries. The interop story is actually fairly easy and it's pretty nice, but we have had, ended up having to write some of that. And likewise, you're still in the front end, you're still going to need to do styling, you're still going to need to write CSS and maybe put, a, you know, use SAS or less or whatever you want to do to write your CSS. And so actually, whenever we've used Blazor projects, we've ended up setting a Webpack build for our front end code. So, you know, you're still in the front end world. This isn't a silver bullet to say, I hate JavaScript. I never want to touch it again. I never need to know anything about the front end. You're still operating on the web browser. You need to know its limitations and how it works. I think overall, these have all come from the fact that Blazor is still very new. It only came out as sort of 1.0 version. I think it was May of this year. And so things are very new. If you're using it, you're definitely going to be on the forefront of technology. And you need to be aware that you're going to run into issues that maybe other people haven't hit before, and you need to do a bit of digging to solve them. And that's definitely going to slow you down a little bit. The open source ecosystem is pretty solid. There's a lot of good work out there, but things are a little bit immature in places and do need a bit of work, and you are going to run into some issues. So I think these are all things that are going to improve over time. Most of those downsides I mentioned, the Blazor team are working on to improve. But you know, there are definitely limitations to be aware of at the moment. So to sum up, when is Blazor the right choice? I think you really need to be aware of the concerns around performance and bundle size are key issues. So especially if you've got any sort of you know big public facing sites where the user experience is key and you you need to run on sort of low powered mobile devices over flaky 3G connections, that's going to be enough to sort of say Blazor is not really the right fit and you should consider something else. When you can rule those out, it tends to be actually quite a good fit. So we found it a really good fit for internal line of business applications where we know people are going to be using it from desktop machines on sort of a, you know a company grade internet connection. And it's actually worked very well for that case. It's also the other thing to be aware of is the framework is quite opinionated. And there's definitely been areas where we found it's best to compromise our initial designs to do things the Blazor way, to do things that Blazor wants to do. If that's a bit of a deal breaker and you really can't compromise your designs at all and you need complete flexibility, again, I'd go for one of the more mature JavaScript UI frameworks because they're more battle hardened and they can support more scenarios. If that's not such an issue and you you know you're willing to be you know willing to change things a little bit, then Blazor can be a great choice. And so overall, we found it to be a really good fit between sort of sitting in the middle of whether we're choosing between to do a sort of standard server-side rendered only application with minimal interactivity and our JavaScript SPA frameworks. It sort of sits as well in the middle of those where it's very easy to add more interactivity than a server-side approach. And it's very quick to get up and running and quicker to get up and running than a client-side JavaScript framework we found, but gives us less flexibility in the long term. And you, know, you are going to run into those issues as your site gets bigger and more complicated. But it's you know, these are all areas where I think it's going to improve over the next few years. It's definitely something keeping an eye, worth keeping an eye on. So if you want to learn anything more, I really recommend just checking the Microsoft docs, the ASP.NET Core docs. They're actually really thorough and a great introduction to Blazor. So you know, I can't hesitate to recommend them enough. But the other thing I want to draw attention to is blazeruniversity.com, which is a really great learning resource. If you're looking to build Blazor applications, this will go through a lot of the actual things you need to think about around sort of the more application concerns, rather than just how Blazor works, but more about how you, you know the things you need to be aware of, how do you actually produce forms, et cetera, and sort of the common problems you're going to have to work through. And there's some really good guides and tutorials on there. So definitely worth taking a look at. So thank you for listening. I hope this has been interesting. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, if you stick them in the chat, I can answer them now. But again, otherwise, if you uh, want to follow up on the slides and code, they're available on my GitHub. Obviously, this talk will be recorded, so you can watch up on that way. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And does anyone have any questions? No worries, cheers, yeah. I think, yeah, thanks, Penny. I think it's actually really useful to know uh, when to use a framework. I think it's quite easy to get caught up on the uh, technology of, you know, the fun technology, but it's worth assessing when it fits best.
Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. So thanks, everyone. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed your entire day. Uh, I think this is the last talk of the day, isn't it? Apart from uh, some wrapping up. So um, yeah, cheers for listening, everyone. And um, if you've got any questions, then feel free to uh, ping me a message. I think my Twitter is linked from the um, from the main tech extra from the, the website with the details. So if you want to ping me any further questions, then uh, feel free to message me on there or DM me. Uh, but thanks, everyone. Cheers, and have a great evening. I will let you go.